As I was thinking about the sermon today, I was struggling with how best to explain it. And whenever I, I sit down to start to prepare a sermon, I, I think I've probably shared this a few times, when I, whenever I sit down to prepare a sermon, you know, I, I struggle with it because, you know, it doesn't come naturally to me like it does, you know, with Pastor Jim. And as I'm sitting there at my desk preparing the sermon, you know, my wife will oftentimes, she'll come by my desk and see me just like going back and forth through all my readings and everything. And she's like, Isaac, you know, just let the Holy Spirit flow through you and, and let him do his work on you. And I'm just like, okay, you just think you know everything. Okay, so. Yeah. <laughs> and she does. I don't want to say she does it. So, okay, I'll, I'll try this Holy Spirit thing and see how this works out here. So I did some reading, and I came across a story about ships and barnacles, which I can relate to, and I thought this would be a great way of explaining what sin does and why repentance is important. To some, it may seem strange to see ships of many nations loading and unloading cargo at the docks in Portland, Oregon. That city is 100 miles from the ocean, and getting there is often a difficult and turbulent passage. But ship's captains like to tie up in Portland. They know that as their ships travel the seas, a curious saltwater sailfish called a barnacle fastens itself to the hole and stays there for the rest of its life, surrounding itself with a rock-like shell. As more and more of these barnacles attach themselves, they increase the ship's drag, slows its progress, and it decreases its efficiency. Periodically, the ship must go into dry dock, where with great effort, the barnacles are chiseled off or scraped off. It's often an expensive process that ties up the ship for days. But not if the captain can get the ship to Portland. Barnacles can't live in fresh water. In fresh water, the barnacles die and some fall away, while those that remain are easily removed. Thus, the ship returns to its task lightened and renewed. Sins are like those barnacles. Hardly anyone goes through life without picking up some. They increase the drag, slow our progress, and decrease our efficiency. Unrepented, building up on one another, they can eventually sink us. In his infinite love and mercy, our Lord has provided a fresh water harbor where through repentance our barnacles fall away and are forgotten. With our souls lightened and renewed, we can go efficiently about our work and his. Let us in our own lives and in the service of the Lord's work shed the barnacles of doubt, laziness, fear, and sin by plying the living waters of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we think about repentance, many of us rightly think about the, faith, the phrase to, to turn away. And that is, in the fact, the definition of the biblical words we translate as repent. Repentance re involves turning away from something and turning toward something else. Many Christians understand that we're to turn away from sin, but we misunderstand what we're to turn toward. Up until recently, I would have said that repentance is turning away from sin and turning to righteousness. But a brother in Christ recently reminded me of a truth that has deepened my hope and joy in repentance. He told me, repentance is not primarily about turning away from sin and turning to righteousness. Repentance is primarily about turning away from sin and turning to Christ. Believing repentance is primarily about turning to righteousness can perpetuate and deepen our commitment to legalism. If we think the chief end of repentance is new behavior and not communion with the person of Christ, then we're reinforcing an anti-gospel hope in our own ability to do better next time. Consider the vastly different outcome of those two versions of repentance. If our response after we sin is, God, I promise I will do better, then the hope is in ourselves. This is a fast track to despair, but if our response after we sin is, God, I need you, give me a fresh measure of you so that 
all, and, and give me all that you have for me because I know I can't do it without you. Then our hope is in a perfectly faithful God and that puts us on a path to joy, peace, and growth in Christ. In the Gospel of Peter, he describes repentance as a personal expression of deep and heartfelt surrender to God, the result of recognizing and acknowledging what Jesus, as our personal Savior, did to reconcile us to God the Father. Repentance unites us with God the Father in Jesus Christ in an extraordinary relationship. One of the many side effects I've experienced getting older is the inability to see the road while driving at night sometime. And everything glows, and, and if it rains, it's as if, if someone is shining a bright light in my eyes. Like the responsible adult that I am, I have yet to go to the eye doctor. <laughs> Thankfully, we don't have to do this as Christians. We've seen the light because the gospel has shined light into the darkness. And this light isn't disorienting. It's a gift of grace that purifies and guides us. But perhaps you've been walking around like you're still in the dark. God calls you to the light. To walk in the light means to walk in the goodness and grace of God, living a life that is reflective of the Savior, and walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. Repentance is one of the clearest ways to walk in this light. The Apostle John tells us if, if we say we fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. To walk in darkness is either to walk with the knowledge of sin and ignore it, or to walk in it as if we, complete, as if we are completely without sin, never repenting. The grace of God allows us to not only acknowledge that, what we, continue, that we continue to struggle with sin, but also to turn from our sin. We see clearly that our walking in the light isn't perfect and it won't even be close. We'll, we'll never reach the perfection here on earth. That's why repentance is such a, a beautiful gift from God. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We confess our sins to God acknowledging our great need for him and to turn us away from our sin. And what does he do? He does what he's already done, pours out the grace we need to change. His wrath was reserved for Jesus and we don't receive that punishment or wrath for our sins. We receive that grace. Now I have to tell you, I get it, you know, repentance is one of those popular topics that most people talk about. You know, in fact, a lot of, you know, Christians often push this subject to the back of the line with all the rest of the uncomfortable subjects that we don't want to talk about. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we don't want to offend people or judge people. But then we must ask the question, are we more concerned about how we might offend others or if we are offending God? As we proclaim what Christ has done for us on the cross, we are believing his word and that sin is not worth it. We grow in our walk with the Lord and the continued removal of sin from our lives. In these moments, we are truly living as new creations and the old versions of ourselves pass away. We are trusting God that what he says is true and that he knows what we need before we even ask it. Make, make no mistake, will we still trip up and make mistakes? Yep, we definitely will. Or another way of putting it, will we still manage to collect those barnacles from day to day as we navigate this life? No doubt, we probably will. But Jesus, in his infinite love and mercy, our Lord has provided a fresh water harbor where through repentance, our barnacles fall away and are forgotten. There was no man ever born into this world that could have stood under the weight of the load that was upon the Son of God when he was carrying my sins and yours and making it possible that we might escape from our sins. This is only possible through the Holy Spirit and having scripture in your heart and mind. God wants us to learn to trust him in all matters, to let his power be perfected in our weaknesses. 
when we trust God's power at work, he'll do greater and more everlasting things than we could ever do for ourselves. We need to rest in the Lord, learn to trust him with all cares and difficult circumstances. Learn to wait for his timing and wait for him to fulfill our needs. And this fulfillment and his fellowship will be far better than a lifetime of anxiety. Somehow or another, we, we think that we've done too much damage to, to receive that forgiveness or that grace. We think we've fallen into temptation way too many times or that we've just messed up too many situations in the past. Or maybe we think we're just, just too far gone. But nothing is further from the truth because we should know that we are not alone in this fight. Forgiveness does not come from anything that we do. Our hope comes from a promise that we are not alone. Jesus was tempted at all points, just as we are. However, he was able to perfectly resist and sinlessly overcome with the word and the power of his Father. Jesus takes responsibility for our sin no matter how many times we mess up. We are not perfect and we will fail sometimes, but Jesus knows the struggle is real. So we can run to him unashamed and unburdened and unrestrained, knowing that in him we will always find unlimited mercy, grace, and forgiveness. You cannot gain victory over your sins using your own wisdom or strength or other resources. You need divine help that only comes through Christ. Christ is our only hope for gaining victory over sins. Trust Jesus can clear your guilt. Trust Jesus can change your habits. Trust repentance through Jesus that all your sins will fall away. And in the name and for the sake of Jesus Christ, amen.